Hello everyone, Mr. Walker here. In this lesson, we're going to be uh, taking a look at and learning about the male reproductive system. I do have a number of video clips and animations, but unfortunately can't show them in this format. A uh, bunch of really good videos. If you just go in and Google Life's Greatest Miracle, it is a PBS Nova series, the entire thing is about an hour in length, but it is broken down into smaller segments. And if you take a look at the first 10 minutes of it, that's what this video is that I would normally be showing at this point here. So in this lesson, we'll talk about the male reproductive structures. We'll talk about how the sperm are actually formed, a process called spermatogenesis. And we'll talk about uh, the hormonal regulation of things that are going on in the male reproductive system. So major structures that are involved with the male reproductive system. Uh, not everything on this diagram you do need to know. In this diagram here, for starters, notice that we are taking a look at the male reproductive system from the front. So just to orient you in terms of uh, structures that we are looking at, ones that you have learned about before, this is the urinary bladder. And what you would have is a ureter here, a ureter here that are carrying the blood or sorry, carrying the urine down in toward the urinary bladder. Of course, that's not what we're concerned about with the reproductive system. We're interested in the structures that are responsible for producing the sperm, uh, supporting those sperm, and eventually getting the sperm out of the body. So these structures that you do need to know about, starting with where the sperm are produced, are in the testes. The testes are very, very long microscopic tubules referred to as the seminiferous tubules. And in each one of the two testes, there are maybe about one kilometer in length of these uh, seminiferous tubules. From where the sperm are produced, they are then uh, transported into a continuation of all of those tubes, something referred to as the epididymis. In these tubules, this coating just on the outside, back sort of top of the testes, that is where we're going to have the storage of the sperm until it is ejaculated, and also the maturation of the sperm. To get the sperm out of the body, now the sperm is going to enter some more macroscopic tubes, larger in diameter, larger in structures, and ones that you can see with the unaided eye. So the first set of these tubes, one coming from each one of the epididymi, is going to be the vas deferens. So one vas deferens associated with each one of the testes on either side of the body. And we can see the vas deferens here. This tube that we see here on this side, and this tube on the other side here. So that's going to be the vas deferens. Sometimes you'll see the name the ductus deferens, but it is, in fact, one and the same thing. So if we follow this tube, it does sort of wrap around the back of the urinary bladder, and these tubes then kind of merge together on the back side. So right around in this region here, it doesn't have it identified on this diagram, but where those two vas deferens are going to merge together, usually that's referred to now as the ejaculatory duct. But again, it is just a continuation of the vas deferens. The exit out of the body, the sperm are then going to be passing through the urethra. But there are a few other important structures that we will encounter along the way. These important structures are glands, not endocrine glands, but exocrine glands. Exocrine glands release their contents onto the surface of the body. And all of these tubules, they are in fact continuous with the outside of the body. And that's what makes these endocrine glands. And these three glands are, and in order, the seminal vesicles, they're tucked in behind the urinary bladder. There are two of them, one associated with each one of the vas deferens. The second one that we have, I'll put this one down as number one in terms of the sequence. The second one in the sequence kind of wraps around what I identified as the ejaculatory duct, and that's going to be the prostate gland, the second one in sequence. This one you can think of as uh, being the donut shape. And the hole is where the ejaculatory duct is going to be passing through. The last one here, um, it does say vulvourethral. That is a name for it, but the one that we use is Cowper's gland. Cowper's gland is the third one. So each one of these are a gland that are going to have uh, various different secretions that are going to be dumped into the um, vas deferens, the ejaculatory duct, or the urethra, and add to the contents 
of what is eventually going to be ejaculated. Similar picture here, only this one is taking a look at a side view instead of the front view. Um, same structures here and some extra structures that you don't need to know about. So any of this external genitalia, you really don't need to know about those structures. I, of course, mentioned the urethra that the sperm are going to pass through. But these other structures, not really important um, for you to know. The important ones, again, as we saw, the testes, which are housed in the scrotum, and we'll see that that is kind of important that they are in the scrotum as opposed to up in the body cavity. The epididymis associated with each one of the testes, the vas deferens for transporting the sperm, the Cowper's gland, prostate gland, vas deferens, seminal vesicles, all those same structures that you should be able to identify both on the side view diagram of the male reproductive system and also on the frontal view that we saw on the previous page. Really, really important picture here. So what this is showing in purple, the purple boxes, are all of the different structures that sperm are actually going to be passing through. So it all starts up at the upper left-hand corner in the scrotum, in the testes, within the inside of the tubules that are the microscopic seminiferous tubules. I mentioned that the scrotum is outside of the body, outside of the body cavity. That is significant because the sperm are only formed at a temperature that is below body temperature. So if they were inside of the body cavity, the temperature would be too warm and the sperm in fact would not be produced. So yeah, really important that the testes are what they call descended. They are within the scrotum and outside of the body cavity. So that is where the sperm are produced and as we will see, that is also the location in the testes, not inside of the seminiferous tubules, but still in the testes, that is also location where testosterone, the male sex hormone, is is going to be produced. So from these seminiferous tubules, those uh, sperm, they are swimmers and they can swim through these tubules and eventually they will reach the tubules of the epididymis. It's in the epididymis where, yes, this is where the sperm are going to be stored as mentioned prior to ejaculation. And this is also where the final maturation of the sperm is going to occur. From there, during ejaculation, the sperm need to get out of the body. So this is really, for the most part, the vas deferens, a transport tube, a macroscopic transport tube for moving the sperm to the outside of the body. It also plays a role in the storage of the sperm, along with the epididymis. From there, I mentioned the vas deferens, they merge together into the ejaculatory duct, eventually traveling into the urethra and exiting the body. What does eventually exit the body, though, is not just the sperm, but it is referred to as semen. So the semen is the sperm, but in fact, most of it is not the sperm. It's other secretions that are added along the way from those three different glands. So again, the three different glands in sequence, the first one that adds its contents to the sperm into the area of the vas deferens and ejaculatory duct is going to be the seminal vesicles, one associated with each one of the vas deferens. So what is added from these seminal vesicles? Well, the big one is going to be an energy supply. Sperm are incredibly small. They do contain the genetic information. They do contain some mitochondria, but not really much more. They don't have enough area, enough space to have an energy reserve inside of the cells. So they have an external energy supply, and that is in the form of fructose. So really important um, for the survival of the sperm until it eventually gets into the female reproductive system, finds an egg and possibly fertilizes an egg. A couple of other secretions, prostaglandins, they are hormones. And when they do interact with the female reproductive system with the uterus, they do cause uterine contractions and that will help to move the sperm up towards its target, which is going to be the egg. And also some uh, water. Again, the sperm, they are swimmers. They need something to swim in. So this water is going to provide the swimming medium or the bulk for the sperm to move around in. The second gland that we have in sequence is the prostate gland, just one single prostate gland. Again, that's kind of the donut shaped gland that the ejaculatory duct is going to be passing through. It produces, um, again, a really important substance. It produces an alkaline buffer. When the sperm 
are ejaculated into the female's vagina, it is in fact an acidic environment. And very importantly, it's acidic for the female because this is going to inhibit the growth of fungi within the vagina, of bacteria within the vagina. But unfortunately, from the male's perspective and the sperm's perspective, it would kill the sperm. So there needs to be some sort of protection for the sperm, and that is the role of the alkaline buffer. So alkaline is the opposite of acidic. It is going to neutralize the acid around the area of the sperm, and buffer just means that it's going to prevent any further changes in pH. It'll maintain a pH in which the sperm can actually survive in. A second secretion kind of has a similar role, the mucus. So if you think about mucus in your stomach, very thick mucus in their stomach is to protect the lining of your stomach against hydrochloric acid. So in this case as well, mucus around the sperm is going to help to protect the sperm so that acid in the female's vagina doesn't come into contact with the sperm itself, and also for lubrication. The last gland that we see here in terms of what you need to know for biology 30 anyway, for the Cowper's gland, uh, it's really just the same secretions as what we saw for the prostate gland, that is the alkaline buffer and the mucus. So all of that is what, again, is eventually ejaculated from the body and the contents coming from the testes, the sperm, coming from the seminal vesicles, the prostate gland, and Cowper's gland is then referred to as the semen. This picture here, we'll take a look at some larger versions of it a little bit later, but just to give you an overview of what we will be looking at, this picture at the top here is a cross section through the testes. So what does that mean? You cut into the ovaries and you take a look at the interior of it. The next picture to the right, they're just zooming in zooming in on one of these now microscopic tubules, again, about one kilometer in length, and they are called the seminiferous tubules. And then we're zooming in a little bit further, taking a look at this kind of pie-shaped wedge within the seminiferous tubules, and we can see there are several different cell types. These several different cell types are listed along the side here, along with a whole bunch of other information that we will be talking about a little bit later. And we'll also see a picture of this guy here a little bit later as well. And that of course is the sperm and different structures that you need to know that make up the sperm. Um, some of this we've already mentioned. So the gonads are referring to the um, organs in the male and female body that are responsible for producing the gametes. In females, that's going to be the eggs, and in males, it's going to be the sperm. And it's going to be, again, those tubes, the seminiferous tubules, and that definitely is a name that you need to know, within, as we will see, the seminiferous tubules that the sperm are going to be formed. Some other really important cells you need to know about as well, um, interstitial cells, also referred to as Leydig cells, they are the ones that make the testosterone, the female sex hormone. We'll take a look at where those are. Mention this one to get the sperm produced. Doesn't happen at normal body temperature, needs to be below body temperature. And that's the idea behind the scrotum and having the testes descended in the scrotum is to ensure that that temperature is below body temperature. So a nice picture here, taking a look at a magnified cross-section through the seminiferous tubules. Each one of these circles that we see is one portion of one long continuous seminiferous tubule. So this picture here, it does identify those cells that I mentioned that you absolutely need to know about. They are called the interstitial cells. And where you find them is not inside of these circles, but you find them in between the circles. Very important because these are the cells that produce the male sex hormone testosterone. You have some other cells inside of the seminiferous tubule. So here we're taking a look at one big seminiferous tubule. And these ones here, Sertoli cells, are inside of the seminiferous tubules, but important that you understand that Sertoli cells do not form the sperm. They will never give rise to sperm. That is not what they do, but they help out. They support and they nourish the sperm. Usually the way that it is represented in a diagram, a sketch that you would see, is it will show cells that seem to be extending through several different layers from the periphery of the seminiferous tubules 
going in toward the center. So that's quite often how they will represent it if you are given a sketch. We're going to see in a few slides later when we talk about the formation of the sperm and uh, that's through the process of meiosis that there are a number of different cell types that they're referring to. And just to give you an idea of where these different cell types are located within the seminiferous tubule, we'll take a look at this picture here. So spermatogonia, spermatogonia, you can think of these as being kind of the most immature forms of the sperm. And as we go toward the center, we're going to have an increase in maturation. So where you find these spermatogonia is really right around the periphery. That's the location of the spermatogonia. When you go a little bit closer to the middle, those are the spermatocytes. And later we'll see that they even break them down into what are called primary and secondary spermatocytes. We won't be too terribly concerned about that though. And then we go a little bit further to the center here again. And these ones here would be the spermatids. And right in the middle, you see all these long sort of squiggly lines here. Those are the tails of the sperm. So these are, well, not necessarily mature sperm. Remember that they do eventually need to make it to the epididymis for maturation to take place. But at least these ones here, they have a head, they have a tail. They're capable of swimming through these fluid-filled tubules and making it to the epididymis. Nice picture here as well. Uh, this one is showing a sketch, so you should be able to take a look at an electron micrograph. You should also be able to take a look at a sketch of the testes, a cross section through the testes, and again, identify a number of different cell types. I mentioned this one here, Sertoli cells, and we can nicely see how it's represented in this diagram. The interstitial or Leydig cells, again, they're not inside of the tubules. They're in between the tubules. And we have those same different cell types, the spermatogonium, which are around the outside. The spermatocytes, a little bit closer toward the middle. The spermatids, a little bit closer to the inside again. And right in the middle is where we have the sperm that do have the head and the tail. More magnified picture again, this one only showing a small section of a seminiferous tubule, but again, the same types of cells that are identified here. This is our pie wedge that we're taking a look at, which is showing the seminiferous tubule, but again, the same names that we're taking a look at. And we'll encounter these again when we do talk about the process of meiosis. So before we talk about um, cell division um, and meiosis specifically, let's just briefly go over a couple of different kinds of cell division. There is mitosis and there is meiosis. Mitosis with the T, this is cell division that's taking place in your body right now whenever your cells need to be replaced, whenever growth is taking place, cell division is taking place and that form of cell division is mitosis. When you were growing, inside your mother's uterus, when you were an embryo, when you were a fetus, this is how you grew, was through the process of mitosis. So that took you from one cell, the fertilized egg or the zygote, to the trillions of cells that you have today. So this is the kind of cell division that does produce genetically identical cells. In theory anyway, all of the cells in your body, they are genetically identical. In order for this cell division to take place, what happens is your chromosomes. You need to duplicate them and you duplicate them once. And then after you duplicate them, well, you split them up. So you have one chromosomal duplication, you have one chromosomal division. This is taking place in really all of the cells or potentially all of the cells in your body except dealing with the formation of the sperm and the eggs. And all of those cells, they are referred to as body or somatic cells. So this would include right now in your body cells that are dividing, your skin cells, your intestinal cells, your blood cells, they are dividing through the process of mitosis. The term that I have at the bottom here, ploidy, 
hoity-toity is a term that uh, you will need to know, and we'll talk a lot more about this in Unit C, but it is the number of copies of each chromosome. So if there is only one copy, we refer to that as haploid, and it is given the symbol N or 1N, meaning that there is one copy of each chromosome. If you have two copies, this is the normal that you typically have in all of the cells in your body, skin, liver, kidney, muscle, neurons, all of them have two copies of each chromosome. That's called diploid, di for two and 2n to represent the number of chromosomes. Sometimes there are more than two copies. Some other species have more than two. Corn, for example, have four copies. They would be 4n, they would be polyploid. So if we go back up to mitosis, what is taking place in your skin cells is you have cells that have two copies of each chromosome. And when that one cell divides into two, one cell that we start with, it divides into two cells. The cell that you started with in the first place was diploid. The cells that you get in the end are also diploid. They are genetically identical to the cell that you started with. They are genetically identical to each other once that cell does divide. So having said all of that, that's not what's going on with spermatogenesis and with the formation of the sperm. Formation of sperm and eggs involves the process of meiosis. So some similarities and also some significant differences here. One of the big differences is now you don't want cells to be identical. You actually want them to be unique. So a male, once a male reaches puberty, is producing millions of sperm every day. And again, in theory, no two of these sperm throughout a male's lifetime should end up being genetically identical. Each one should be unique. In terms of duplication and division of chromosomes, there is still, like with mitosis, one duplication of the chromosomes, but now you split them up twice. So because you split them up twice, you have two divisions after one duplication. So now what we're doing is we're having the chromosome number. We go from a cell that has two copies of each chromosome to what we will see is four cells in the case of the sperm, four cells that have only one copy of each chromosome. So what is this for? Well, in us, it's only for the gametes or the sex cells, the sperm or the eggs, whatever you want to call them. This is the process that forms in the male, the sperm, through this process of spermatogenesis. All of these details we will leave for later in unit C, but just to get an overview of what is going on with the formation of the sperm, we're starting with spermatogonia. Spermatogonia are going to duplicate their chromosomes to form spermatocytes. So inside of the nucleus here, they are duplicated chromosomes. And then what's going to happen is we're going to have two divisions. First meiotic division, I just abbreviate that M1, and then we have the second meiotic division, M2. So we start with one cell, and in the case of the sperm, you end up with four cells. What can we say about these four cells? Well, each one is going to be unique. They're going to be different. They're certainly not going to be the same as the primary spermatocyte, and they don't have the same chromosome number. If we're talking about human chromosomes numbers, it is 46 in the spermatogonia and the primary spermatocyte. It is 23 once you do get to the spermatids and eventually the sperm. So then using the ploidy numbers, we would say that the primary spermatocytes are diploid, whereas the sperm are each going to end up being haploid, having one copy of each chromosome. This picture here, um, again, is just going to match up the different ploidy abbreviations that we have, diploid and haploid, along with the events that are taking place and the names of the various different sperm cell types. So we're starting at the top with spermatogonial stem cells. We do have mitotic divisions that are going to continually replace these spermatogonial cells. So for this reason, the male throughout his lifetime will um, never run out of these. They can always be replaced. So a male will always have a supply of spermatogonium, which means they will have a supply throughout their entire lifetime to go through this process and make the spermatocytes, the spermatids, and eventually the sperm. 
So overall with this diagram, just kind of keep in mind that we're going from diploid cells to haploid cells. It involves one duplication of the chromosomes and two divisions that are taking place. We start with one cell. If we take a look at this one here, the primary spermatocyte, and from that one, we end up with four haploid unique sperm cells. This is the sperm. These are the structures that you should know. So a very distinctive cell, of course, not really any others in your body that look like this one. So you should be able to identify uh, for sure some of the structures, the head region. Within the head region, you have uh, two important things. The nucleus, where you do find the chromosomes, the haploid number of chromosomes. So in humans, that's going to be 23 chromosomes. But you also have a very important structure right in the front called the acrosome. This is what will eventually allow the sperm to enter the egg and to combine its genetic information and in the nucleus with the nucleus from the egg. You also have the uh, midpiece here, sort of a widened portion after the head, and it's within the midpiece that you have the mitochondria. It's those mitochondria that are going to rely upon those secretions that are coming from the seminal vesicles, the fructose, for their energy supply in order to make ATP. And that ATP is necessary for this tail to whip around and move the sperm toward its target, toward the egg. This should look somewhat familiar. We see a sequence of three different glands and using the same pattern that we did before, this would be our gland A, the hypothalamus, gland B, the anterior pituitary, and in this case, our gland C is going to be the testes. So each one of these glands is going to produce its own hormones. The hypothalamus in this case is influencing the anterior pituitary, so it is going to involve a releasing hormone. The hormone in this case is called gonadotropin or gonadotropic releasing hormones. The testes are the male gonads, so gonadotropic releasing hormone is eventually going to target the gonads or influence the gonads. In this case, of course, it's indirectly because we have the releasing hormone telling the anterior pituitary to produce and release its own hormones and they are abbreviated FSH and LH. These two hormones here are collectively referred to as the gonadotropic hormones. FSH and LH are the gonadotropic hormones produced by the anterior pituitary. You need to know specifically not only that they target the testes, but what portion of the testes. So FSH is specific for the Sertoli cells, and it's the Sertoli cells that need to be stimulated for this to occur, spermatogenesis. Without FSH, you don't get spermatogenesis. For the other anterior pituitary hormone, the other gonadotropic hormone, it is a luteinizing hormone. And once again, you need to know this one is specific for. Now here I have the Leydig cells, but you should remember that they're also referred to as the interstitial cells. And those are the ones that produce testosterone. So again, you need the FSH for sperm to be made. You need the luteinizing hormone for testosterone to be made. But there's another little bit of a catch here. You also need testosterone for spermatogenesis. So you need both the FSH and the testosterone in order for spermatogenesis to really take place. And we also nicely see that we have a negative feedback here. So the final hormone is going to regulate its own production. The final hormone is testosterone. So we can see negative feedback that's going back to both the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary. Once there is a sufficient amount of testosterone circulating around, receptors on the hypothalamus and anterior pituitary will allow testosterone to attach to it, and that'll decrease the production of the releasing hormone and the two gonadotropic hormones. So again, important for you to realize that FSH is for Sertoli cells, luteinizing is for Leydig cells, or I'm going to put in here 
the interstitial cells because that's really the name that you should remember. So both of them needed to promote spermatogenesis. Um, again, animations, I can't play you here, but you can take a look at this one here on the male hormone regulation. That one is in D2L, and it takes you through uh, really what we saw on the previous slide, the hypothalamus, the anterior pituitary, the testes, the production of testosterone, and the negative feedback upon the anterior pituitary and the hypothalamus. And yeah, so negative feedback, again, we saw this all throughout the endocrine unit, how important that is in regulating the production of hormones and ensuring that there is a sufficient amount, but not too much of the hormone being produced. And that certainly does have to be the case with the testosterone as well. I did show another hormone on that diagram, and that was inhibin, kind of a minor one here, but this is one that's produced by the Sertoli cells, and same sort of effect by turning off the production of gonadotropic hormones from the anterior pituitary. And the last slide that I have here, what exactly does testosterone do? Well, we already saw you need it for the sperm, along with the follicle stimulating hormone. Uh, production of the sperm does require testosterone. When testosterone is initially produced is really early during embryonic development. So about the eighth week after the sperm fertilizes the egg, really just a mass of cells at this point, not much more, certainly doesn't uh, look like a human being at this point, very small in size, but at that point, there is an increase in the amount of testosterone in a male. And what makes it a male? The Y chromosome. So if there is a Y chromosome, Testosterone will be produced at about the eighth week of embryonic development. At this point in the early embryo, there are in fact both male and female reproductive structures. It could be either a boy or a girl. With an increase in testosterone, that means that the male genitalia are going to develop. In fact, it's probably a little bit more complicated than that, probably much more complicated than that, but this is in general what you need to know anyway, Y chromosome testosterone, you end up with the male genitalia that are going to form in embryonic development. And what about the female genitalia? Well, they're going to degenerate. What are some of the other functions of testosterone? So primary sex characteristics would include the formation of the sperm. Secondary sex characteristics are other things that are not necessarily directly related to the ability to reproduce. So when a male does reach adolescence, puberty, sexual maturity, whatever you do want to call it, there is an increase in body hair, there is an increase in facial hair, and that is due to testosterone, or at least part in due to testosterone. Further genitalia development when the male reaches adolescence, deepening of the voice, it's going to target the larynx and lead to a deepening of the voice, increased muscle mass. Muscles are one of the targets for testosterone. And if someone is taking synthetic testosterone, that's also something that's going to increase the muscle mass. And finally, sex drive. And this is the case both in males and in females. Females do also produce testosterone. Males also produce the female sex hormones, estrogen and progesterone. Testosterone, less of it produced in females. And um, if a female does have low sex drive, one of the treatments for that is to give that female testosterone and that will increase her sex drive.